Good evening, I'm Sarah Sapsanama. Let's begin with the headlines of the hour. Former Speaker and CPN Maori Centre Deputy Chair Mahara arrested for alleged involvement in gold smuggling case released on condition that he appears when summoned. International conclave on global peace for prosperity commences in Lumbini. Minister for Foreign Affairs says war, armed conflict and geopolitical polarisation adding challenges. Russia launches largest missile and drone attack on Ukrainian energy infrastructure, hitting the country's largest dam and causing blackouts in several regions. Zelensky urges Western allies for more air defenses. And 17th edition of Indian Premier League IPL begins this evening. Defending champions Chennai Super Kings hosting Royal Challengers Bengaluru in the inaugural match. Former Speaker and CPN Maui Centre Deputy Chair Krishna Bahadur Mahara, who was arrested for his alleged involvement in the gold smuggling case, has been released on condition that he appears when summoned. Following conclusion of a recording of statements in presence of the representatives of the Government Attorney Office, Mahara was released in the presence of his elder son, Nirmal Mahara. Despite his release, investigations on his involvement in the gold smuggling case are underway. Bahara, arrested in Pakari of Kapilvastu district, was flown to Kathmandu from Bhairahawa Airport for investigation and later remanded to four days in custody by the Kathmandu District Court. Citing his health condition, the court has allowed him to remain in hospital during the custody period and subsequently he was admitted to Norwich Hospital in Thapathali. Prior to this, an inquiry commission had submitted its report after studying the lapses in police investigation into the scam that involved the smuggling of 60 kilograms of gold by hiding it inside motorcycle brake shoes last year and also into another scam wherein 9 kilograms of gold was smuggled by concealing it inside electronic cigarettes back in December 2022. The district attorney's office filed a case against Rahul, son of former Speaker Mahara, in October last year for his alleged role in smuggling of 9 kilograms of gold. The Bureau had taken Rahul into custody on August 30 last year for investigation. As per a government report, the, the father-son duo had been in regular contact with Chinese gold smugglers with a total of 256 phone conversations between them. CIB had earlier filed a case against Mahara's son, Rahul only. Seven months after the arrest of Rahul, Krishna Bahadur Mahara was also dragged into investigations. Prime Minister Pushpa Kamal Dahal has met with CPN UML Chair KP Sharma Oli to discuss on the government's activities and the prospects of including CPN UML in Socialist Front. The meeting was held in Prime Minister's office in Singadarwar and it also dwelt on the effectiveness of the House and the implementation of the ruling coalition's resolution proposal. Earlier, the Socialist Front had held a meeting and dwelt on calling for participation of CPN UML. Political parties that have concluded the power share in the centre are now in the provincial race. Parties of the ruling coalition are yet to reach a conclusion on leadership in the provinces. While CPN Maui Centre is in favour of retaining leadership in the provinces where it led the government, while CPN UML has been making efforts to lead the governments previously headed by Nepali Congress while also strengthening its position in other provinces. The federal ruling coalition parties are making preparations to share the province leadership among CPN UML, CPN Maui Center, Janata Samajwadi Party, and CPN Unified Socialists. However, a clear draft on power allocation is yet to be formulated. CPN UML has claimed leadership in Koshi and Karnali and one among Lumbini and Gandaki. CPN Maui Center aims to retain its leadership in Bagmati and Gandaki provinces and may have to let go of Karnali, for which party chair and Prime Minister Pushpa Kamal Dahal will have to manage the party's internal dynamics. Having appointed Barsha Manpun as the Minister for Finance, the Hal might give continuity to Karnali leadership to gain confidence of Janadan Sharma. With inclusion of CPN UML in Madhish province government, Janata Samajwadi is likely to continue leading the province. CPN Unified Socialists, which had shared its stance while issuing the vote of confidence in the centre, is likely to lead Sudur Pashim province. For CPN UML to lead Koshi province, Chief Minister Kedar Karki must furnish his resignation. Support of two additional members is required to retain coalition in Bagmati, where Nepali Congress is also making efforts to form the government. Support of parties and members of province assembly from outside the coalition is required in Gandaki, Lumbini and Sudarpashim provinces as well. 
In the absence of clear majority, the ruling coalition will not find it easy to change the power equations in the provinces. Chief Justice Bishwambar Prasad Shrestha has said that the judiciary has been returning to regular operations in recent time. Addressing the inaugural session of the first conference of women judges that began in Kathmandu, Chief Justice Shrestha said that the judiciary was operating in the manner it should with the joint effort of stakeholders. Shrestha added that the gradual increase in representation of women in the legal sector and the judiciary was a positive aspect. He also said that it was a reflection of equality. Minister for Law Padam Giri also expressed the commitment of expediting works related to formulation of necessary laws. Minister Giri went on to say that the participation of women in the legal sector increased hopes for strengthening the sector. The conference concludes tomorrow. An international conclave on global peace for prosperity has commenced in Lumbini, the birthplace of Gautam Buddha. Inaugurating the conference, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Foreign Affairs Naran Kaji Shrestha said that world peace and prosperity were facing increased challenges because of wars, armed conflicts, geopolitical competitions and polarization. Shrestha said that the conference was organized at the holy place of Lumbini to erase the inequalities and proceed with the agenda of peace and prosperity. Let us pray for peace from the fountain of peace, Lumini, for all living beings on the earth. Let peace prevail over conflict and happiness over misery. Non-residential ambassadors of 19 countries, including Austria, Czech Republic, Mauritius, Mongolia, Indonesia, Serbia and Spain, and consuls of other countries for Nepal have reached Lumbini for the conference. The representatives who had reached Lumbini on Thursday had also visited the Kamakya Temple of Palpa in cable cars from Butwal. Discussions were held between the industrialists and tourism businesses regarding prospects of investment in Nepal this morning. At the seminar, the businesses urged for inviting foreign direct investment in the country. Participants of the program are to visit the Maya Devi Temple of Lumbini and other monasteries as well. The event is being hosted jointly by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Honorary Consular Corps, Nepal. According to international organization Global Cancer Observatory, cases of cervical cancer were seen in 2,169 people in Nepal in the year 2020. To reduce the risk of cervical cancer, the government has provided human papillomavirus HPV vaccine to around 10,000 young females in the first stage of the vaccine campaign administered about six months ago. The second stage of the vaccine campaign is being administered now. Cervical cancer can be cured if treated on time. The Nepal government is providing HPV vaccines through campaigns. However, many have not received it. The government had purchased 20,000 vaccines, out of which it provided the vaccines to around 10,000 female youths some six months ago. Now, the second stage of the vaccine campaign is being administered. The World Health Organization has recommended to provide HPV vaccines to girls between 9 to 15 years of age. However, due to limited number of vaccines, it has been provided to only 10,000 girls who are 15 years of age. The 2021 population census of Nepal shows that uh, there are more than 200,000 girls that are 15 years old. The World Water Day is being observed with the objective of increasing awareness regarding the proper use of water and conservation of sources of water. On the occasion, Hetora Drinking Water Management Board has brought into operation two sump wells. The two sump wells built at Makwanpurgari Rural Municipality, Ward No. 4, Samari, in the border area of Hetora Submetropolis and Makwanpurgari Rural Municipality have been brought into operation. According to Hetora Drinking Water Management Board, the sump wells, built at an investment of 2.5 million rupees, are to collect around 6 million litres of water each day. The board has been distributing 26.2 million litres of drinking water to 160,000 local residents of 19 wards of the Hetora Submetropolis on a daily basis. Local residents of higher region of Patsar, including Falilung, have begun moving downwards to Choyaban and Thapli because of continuous snowfall. The local residents and farmers have begun dropping to lower regions with their cattle because of snowfall up to four and a half feet. 
Incessant rainfall from Wednesday morning has resulted in dip in mercury in parts of in parts including Fallout, Char Rati and Surkhetham of Falilung 4 along with Sandakpur in the border region of Ilam and Pajthar. The snowfall is likely to continue in the region. Parts of the border outposts located in Fallout bordering with India have also been covered by snow. Armed police force have been busy in removing the snow to clear the area. It is time now for our segment Public Pulse where you text us with your opinion. The question is what's your take on the practice of transferring budget from one project to another? Your options are A. Lapses in project selection, B. High handedness of those with access to power and C. A way to spend the budget. The voting is on. Type NEWS, select your option A, B or C and send it to 34001 to share your opinion with us. Time now for international update. Russia has launched the largest missile and drone attack on Ukrainian energy infrastructure of the war to date, hitting the country's largest dam and causing blackouts in several regions, according to Kyiv. The Ukrainian Air Force has said 88 missiles and 63 Shahed drones were fired, of which around 37 and 55 were shot down, respectively. It called the ratio worse than usual, adding that it may reflect the widespread use of hypersonic and ballistic missiles that are harder to down. The Dnipro Hes Dam in the southern city of Zaporizhia suffered strikes in, to its hydraulic structures and to the dam itself, state hydropower company Ukra Hydro, Ukra Hydro Energy said, adding there was no risk of a breach. The salvo was the largest attack on Ukraine's energy infrastructure, said Energy Minister German Galushchenko. President Volodymyr Zelensky, who has been urging Western allies to supply more air defenses, condemned the attack and said there was work underway to repair power supply in nine regions. Russia denies deliberately targeting civilians, though the war that began with its full-scale invasion in February 2022 has resulted in the deaths of thousands of people the uprooting of millions and the destruction of Ukrainian towns and cities. More than 70 Rohingya are presumed dead or missing after a boat they were on capsized off the coast of Indonesia's Akhe province, while 75 have been rescued, according to UNHCR Refugee Agency. The agency has also said in a joint statement with the International Organization for Migration that if the death toll was confirmed, it would be the biggest loss of life so far this year. The alert was raised on Wednesday when fishermen rescued six of the migrants. A fishing community in Aki said they had been standing on the hull of the boat after it capsized due to high tides. For years, Rohingya have left Buddhist-majority Myanmar, where they are generally regarded as foreign interlopers from South Asia, denied citizenship and subjected to abuse. More than 2,300 Rohingya arrived in Indonesia last year, based on UNHCR data, surpassing the number of arrivals in the previous four years combined. The 2023 toll of at least 569 Rohingya dead or missing while trying to flee Myanmar or Bangladesh was the highest since 2014. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken arrived in Israel today after visiting Egypt, where he said a ceasefire deal between the Palestinian militant group Hamas and Israel could still be reached. Negotiations in Qatar centered on a truce of around six weeks that would allow the release of 40 Israeli hostages in return for hundreds of Palestinians detained in Israeli jails, paving the way for more aid to enter Gaza enclave, where famine looms due to extreme food shortages. The main sticking point has been that Hamas says it will release hostages only as part of a deal that would end the war, while Israel says it will discuss only a temporary pause. A Palestinian official with the knowledge of the mediation efforts told Hamas had demonstrated flexibility. Israel continues to stall because it does not want to commit to ending the war on Gaza, the official said. Israel's spy chief was due to travel to Qatar on Friday for ceasefire negotiations. The death toll from the ongoing Israeli attacks on the Gaza Strip has risen to 31,988, according to Hamas-run Ministry of Health in Gaza. The ministry said in a statement that the Israeli army killed 65 Palestinians and wounded 92 others during the past 24 hours, bringing the total death toll to 31,988. 
This comes as Israeli army continues its operations in the Al Shifa hospital in Gaza city for the fourth day, during which about 600 Palestinians have been apprehended and more than 140 others have been killed, the Israeli army said in a statement on Thursday, claiming all of them are militants. Several weapons and intelligence documents were discovered during searches in the hospital, according to the statement. The Israeli army conducted a raid on about 100 buildings in a town near Khan Yunis in southern Gaza, killing dozens of Palestinian armed personnel and discovering a large number of weapons, according to the Thursday statement. The Israeli Air Force also carried out airstrikes on military targets in Khan Yunis and Rafah. Amid the ongoing Israel-Hamas conflict, satellite images analyzed by the United Nations Satellite Center show that 35% of the Gaza Strip's buildings have been destroyed or damaged in the Israeli offensive in the Palestinian enclave as of 29th of February. With more than 80,000 buildings in the Gaza Strip damaged and more than 31,000 completely destroyed. The World Health Organization has said children in Gaza are dying from the combined effects of malnutrition and disease. Children in hospitals are suffering from severe dehydration and malnutrition, leaving their parents helpless. The WHO is helping to set up stabilization and nutrition centers in Gaza, but said it has seen a high number of severe malnutrition, severe acute malnutrition uh, with complications in children in recent weeks. <laughs> حصلوا دم وتفاجأت إيش شاب 11 11 دم ضعيف جدا يعني في الأيام العادية يعني لا في بيض لا في بروتين لا في لا لحوم لا في أسماك لا في خضرة. WHO Director General Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus said on Thursday that only an expansion of land crossings into Gaza could prevent help prevent in fact famine in the densely populated Palestinian enclave. Rescuers managed to drill a half of 262 meters of the Pioneer Mine, where 13 Russian miners have been trapped under rubble for almost four days. The miners were trapped on Monday by a rockfall at the Pioneer Gold Mine. The mine, one of Russia's largest, is located in the Amur region, which borders China about 5,300 kilometers east of Moscow. The mine is owned by sanctions-hit Russian copper and gold producer UMMC. That is all for the moment. Thank you for watching. Bye for now.